Now we're going to get into a little different kind of fun. We've got our first uh, uh, presidential candidate for you here coming out to spend a little bit of time with you. I'm particularly pleased to have the opportunity to introduce this gentleman. He was uh, the governor of my home state, the great state of New York. Uh, I, that's right. He's a, and, uh, you know, my husband and I, you know, say all the time, we take credit. We got him elected the first time, and then we moved on to do other things. But uh, he served three terms, three consecutive terms as a Republican governor in a very blue state. He cut taxes. He balanced the budget, brought all sorts of innovations and job growth to the great state of New, of, of New York. And when New York needed him most in the aftermath of 9-11, he was there to lead. He was there to lead, to come to care and to move the state forward. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce to you the former governor of New York, George Pataki. After you, Peter. Good morning. Governor, thank you so much. Jennifer, good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> little set change here. <laughs> My name is Peter St. James. I'm the host of uh, the New Hampshire Wake Up Show on WTPL 1077 in Concord. And I was asked to moderate uh, this session of the program. And uh, as a broadcaster in New Hampshire for a lot of years, it's a thrill for me because I know that what's said here today won't just be heard in Nashua and Manchester and Concord and Portsmouth but it'll be heard in Iowa, and in South Carolina, and New York, and Ohio, <laughs> and that's why New Hampshire will stay first in the nation. So it's a privilege to be here this morning. Uh, the gentleman on my left is here as, in his capacity as chairman of We the People and not Washington. And during the course of the week leading up to this, uh, hundreds and hundreds of questions were solicited from people around the state uh, via social media, and we're gonna try to answer many of those questions this morning. Many of you know Governor Pataki uh, by his, the quality of leadership that he displayed in New York after September 11th. But many of you may not be aware or maybe you forgot what shape New York was in when he took over as governor. In 1994, it was the most dangerous state <laughs> in America. One out of every 11 New Yorkers was on welfare. They were billion, a billion dollars in debt with an abysmal credit rating. This man turned it around. It is my pleasure to introduce George Pataki. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. And Peter is not just a, a broadcaster here in New Hampshire. He is the New Hampshire Broadcaster of the Year. So congratulations to you, Peter, for that. And, it's, uh, and I am also joined by, by my beloved wife and mother of our four children, Libby. Thank you for being here with me this morning. And thank you all for being here. You are the activists from across this state and other parts of the country who are going to make sure that we reclaim the White House in 2016 for the people of America. So thank you all for being here. And as Peter said, we're going to do things a little differently. You know, as Hillary runs across the country in her converted van, hiding from people, running from the press, only answering staged questions from people who have been planted somewhere across America, we are going to take questions from normal citizens from across New Hampshire. So we opened it up on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and said, send us a question and we'll try to get to it this morning. So Peter, Excellent. I guess you have a lot of those questions. Let's go. Questions from New Hampshireites. And to show you it's legit, there they are on the screens. You can see them and you'll see the video questions as well. Uh, I Governor, can't see them. <laughs> your first question. Yes, please. Ted Dawson from Northfield, New Hampshire said, what are your thoughts on term limits at all levels of government, starting at the top and working our way down? You know, I think, <laughs> I guess there's some support for term limits out here. Uh, let me tell you, I think term limits are absolutely critical. When this country was created, 
we didn't have the concept of a separate class of politicians who are different from the American people, who go off to Washington, spend 45 years in public office, and when they're done, stick around as a lobbyist. The politicians are supposed to be us. They're supposed to reflect the people of America. And term limits, making sure people don't go there for their entire lifetime career is an important part of this. But Peter, it's not just that reform alone. What happens in Washington today is it's an insider's game. And to be honest, it doesn't matter which party is in control. The lobbyists control too much. The lawyers, the interest groups control too much. So we need to change a number of things to reform how Washington does business. Yes, term limits. But also, you know, if Congress passes a law like Obamacare, which should be repealed, and says it's a good law, it's going to apply to every American in every community across this country, it should apply to them as well. Congress and members of their staff should be required to live under the laws that they passed. And by the way, under Harry Reid and the Democrats, for six years, the Senate never passed a budget. They didn't do their job. What happens if you don't do your job? You don't get paid. They should pass a law saying when there is no budget adopted by Congress, they don't get paid until that budget is passed as well. But by far to me, the most important reform is to break the stranglehold lobbyists have on Washington. When you get elected, you play the game, and you know within six months, you don't ever go back home. You're elected from New Hampshire, New York, Nevada, New Mexico, if you don't run again or if you don't win, you don't go home. You stay in Washington and become a lobbyist. Today, there are over 400 former members of Congress who are registered lobbyists in Washington, D.C. The first law I will propose, you serve one day in Congress, the House or Senate, there is a lifetime ban on ever being a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. Go home. Go back to the people who sent you there and represent them. So, Peter, a couple of reforms. All right. <laughs> Second question from Andrew Hemingway of Manchester. And I'm sure you've heard this one before. <laughs> oh, you know, you know the name. OK. Uh, I've, I know you've heard this before, but you, we haven't heard the answer. What did you learn from September 11th? Uh, well, I'd say there's two important lessons from September 11th. The first is that. Islamic terror is real, and we should call it by its name, and we should also recognize that the fact that their bases and training camps are thousands of miles overseas don't mean we're safe in New York or we're safe in New Hampshire, and we have to be proactive and aggressive in going after them over there before they have the chance to attack us here again. That's lesson number one. But there's another lesson as well. And for all the sadness and sorrow I feel when I go to Lower Manhattan or I think of September 11th, there was an outpouring of American strength I've never seen in my lifetime. There was a sense that we had been attacked as Americans. We weren't Republicans or Democrats, black or white, young or old, Northerners or Southerners. We were Americans. And I saw the strength of America come together. And I saw people from every corner of this country coming to help us rebuild, reclaim, and soar to stronger and higher heights than we had ever achieved before. And that, to me, is the lesson of September 11th. When we are united as Americans with a common purpose, when we put aside the superficial differences that seem so important, there is nothing we as Americans cannot accomplish. And we have got this sense again, that belief that we're all in this together, we have a common destiny, a common future, seize it and make the 21st century America's greatest century. Next question from Joseph Mangeli. Are you running for president? <laughs> There's a lot of cameras here. I have to be careful what I say. No, just between you and me. <laughs> oh, all right. In that case, you know, I, I, I kid when I go around New Hampshire, and this is my eighth trip since September, that every four years there's the Olympics, the World Cup, and Pataki shows up thinking about running for president. And that seems to be true. But in all seriousness, Peter, this time things are different. I look at what's happening in the world, and I've never seen the world in my lifetime 
as inflamed, in flames as it is today. I've never seen the overseas threat to America greater. Leading from behind does not work. And then I look at Washington, and I see a government that believes it is our master, not our servant. They are smarter than we are. They have to tell us how to live our lives. And to me, the need to change the direction of this country's government, the need to take back Washington, to reduce its size, reduce its cost, reduce its intrusiveness, has never been greater. So I can tell you, I am much more inclined to run this time than I've ever been before. And I get, a, I get a little emotional here, so let me roam around a little bit too, Peter. But go ahead. During the course of the week, I saw this at the uh, radio station one morning. You introduced a, a new commercial uh, from We the People, Not Washington. I don't, don't know if everybody's seen it. So uh, right now, we're going to show you the commercial. Defeating Islamic terror. Shrinking government. Growing the economy. These are the issues that matter most. Instead, we're debating social issues like abortion and gay rights. They're a distraction and will only help elect Hillary. After eight years of Obama-style socialism, we need to shrink government, not let big government tell us how to live our lives. Log on. Learn more. Very nice. Thank you, Peter. Here's the part I like. I get to play Richard Dawson. Uh, <laughs> uh, they had put together, your, your people had put together uh, the, what's called the lightning round. Short, and I know this may be difficult, short answers. Very brief. Uh, 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 let me sit down for this okay. one. I, I don't know what's coming up here. I know you're playing against <laughs> type on this one. All right. Favorite president? Uh, I love Reagan. Short. Teddy Roosevelt. Abraham Lincoln, because he brought the promise of American freedom to everyone, and that's what our party has always stood for. Last book you read? The Traitor's Wife. I know it's obscure, but it was written by our daughter, hit number five on the New York Times bestseller list. And if I said any other book, I could probably not go home next week. So. Well, here's where you're going to alienate some people. I, I'm good sorry, at that. Sorry, sorry. iPhone, Blackberry, or Android? iPhone. And I don't have a <laughs> server. I don't have a server in the basement. Well. <laughs> Game of Thrones, House of Cards, or Orange is the New Black? Our kids love uh, Game of Thrones, but I got to go with House of Cards. Anything, <laughs> anything that makes Washington look worse than it is is something I'm in favor of. <laughs> Wine or beer? Both. <laughs> <laughs> During the day, beer. At night, wine. <laughs> uh, Taco Bell or... Is this Chipotle? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Li that? Libby and I went to Chipotle yesterday. She didn't wear sunglasses. <laughs> I wasn't in disguise. We said hello to everybody, and I left a tip. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> my, my mother was a waitress, and she is still going strong, so if I didn't, I would have heard it. Uh, so that leads us to the next one. Home server? Or office server? <laughs> uh, whatever it's connected to, I don't know, but I'm sure NSA does. <laughs> uh, favorite New Hampshire talk show host? Oh, Who snuck it, that in? Um, yeah. It's got to be <laughs> Peter. You know, there's no question about it. I mean, so far. There really don't screw a lot of wiggle room there, Governor. <laughs> uh, cats or dogs? Dogs. Good. We have two. Worst moment in your public life? Uh, I could talk about polls, but that's, uh, no. In all seriousness, I will never forget this moment. It was uh, three days after September 11th, and President Bush had come to ground zero and given an inspirational talk. And afterwards, we went up to meet with the families of those who, at that point, were still missing, thousands of them. And the tears in those family members of the mothers and the fathers and the husbands and the wives and the saddest part, though, was they still had hope. And I remember a woman showing me pictures of her daughter and saying she knew every tunnel down there because she worked there, and I know she's alive somewhere below ground. And in my heart, 
I knew that she had died. But I just, none of us could bring ourselves to dash that little remnant of hope they still had in their hearts. So there were a lot of tears. It was a terrible day. It was a very sad day, one I will never forget, and one where I hope Americans never forget the sadness of when we do not do everything in our power to protect our safety. Let's go 180, your best moment ah. in public life. Uh, I could say, you know, being uh, right on, behind first base when the Yankees beat the Red Sox, but that would get, that would get everybody. That would get everybody. I, I, I would never, ever say anything like that. And I mean, yeah, what I was I possibly that. thinking? <laughs> I, I, I do have to tell you. Wow. One, one moment I will never forget, one great moment. While I was governor, Pope John Paul II came to America and came to New York, and I met him at Ground Zero. And the next morning, he had a sunrise mass in Central Park. And I remember so well sitting in the front, uh, and Libby and I were there, our kids were there, our youngest child was sitting in my lap, and it was a misty morning, and you could barely see, and the entire park was covered in mist, and Pope John Paul comes out to do the mass, and the sun comes up, and the mist parts, and it was just the most magical moment, and one that I know we will always cherish, and one that I have just, will never forget having a smile and a good feeling in my heart. You ready to go back to work? More questions from people? Sure. All right. That's why uh, we're here. Keith Carlson of Cheshire County uh, sent in a question, said Obamacare just keeps getting worse and worse. Now, we know that the Cadillac tax problem is coming. Have you considered the health care compact as the solution, as nine states have already said? You know, I, I don't think there is one solution. Uh, first of all, you start by repealing Obamacare. And, and it is the worst law, it is the worst law of my lifetime. Uh, and I think, though, even if the Democrats had read it before they passed it, they still would have rammed it through because that's how they believe. It is the worst law of my lifetime. And part of the problem is it's one size fits all. Washington is going to dictate to every community, every family, every state how they run their health care system. That's not America. When I was governor, we put in place very good health care policies using the market and using patient-centric proposals. And we created programs for low-income adults working to get quality health care. We put in place programs for uh, entrepreneurs and small business people who couldn't pool together to get quality, affordable health care provided by the private sector but supported by the state. And when I left, we had millions more who had been uninsured covered in a market-based system. So states can do that. Uh, we should allow consumers to purchase across state lines. We should get rid of the junk negligence lawsuits that drive up the cost of medicine. And is strictly the only reason that hasn't happened is because the Democratic politicians are in the pockets of the trial lawyers. And we have to put that aside and do what's right for the people and not the politicians. So there are solutions, market-based solutions, that states under our Constitution should have the right to decide themselves what they choose to do. All right. Uh, if you watch the screen, we have a video question now. Governor. Governor Pataki, hi, Mike DiMartino from Exeter, New Hampshire. I've served our country for the last 12 years, I'm a veteran, and unfortunately, it seems like we're slipping backward. How would you handle Iran, ISIS, and the threats in the Middle East? You know, first of all, as I, as I said earlier, you have to recognize that it is not just random acts of violence, it is Islamic terror that we are being challenged by in the 21st century. The first thing I would do is rebuild our military. We should not have a military. We should not have a, a military smaller than it was before World War II when the world is as dangerous as it is today. We should strengthen it. We should expand it. We should make it more powerful, not because we want to use it, but so that we don't have to use it. And it is clear, it is clear what works. 
Ronald Reagan had a very simple expression, peace through strength. Right now, we have chaos through weakness. We, our allies need to trust our word. We need to stand with them, whether it's Israel or Egypt, who is our partner in this fight against radical Islam. And our enemies must be afraid of us. And by the way, Michael, thank you for your service. There are no finer people than the men and women who put on the uniform of our country to defend our freedom. And I'm particularly, I'm particularly proud because uh, Libby and I have two sons. And both of them after college went into the service. One was a Marine Lieutenant in Anbar for a year. The other got back with the 10th Mountain Division from Afghanistan in September. We're proud of them. We're proud of everybody who has put the uniform of this country on. And by the way, I'm just going to take 30 seconds. Any people who have served in the military here, please raise your hands and let us give you a round of applause for what you have done to protect our freedom. God bless you. Thank you. And just, just one other thought, forgive me, Peter. Our government is so big, you know, they talk about companies being too big to fail. Our government is too big to succeed. It is so big, it can't do its two most important things, provide for our security and provide a safety net for those who have risked their lives. We have to do far better with veterans' benefits. And if we have the opportunity, we are going to make sure veterans get the health care and the support that they deserve in this country. Continuing in our multimedia presentation, we have an audio question now from Anne Marie Banfield of Bedford. Governor Pataki, parents around the country are mobilizing against Common Core in their school districts. However, the Obama agenda to redesign public education goes beyond Common Core standards to reshaping public education from a liberal arts model to a workforce development model. Parents in New Hampshire never asked for this, and as it's being implemented in our schools, we are starting to see real problems. As president, how would you work to return local control back to the parents, board members, and educators? I think that's a very important question to every parent here and really to every American. First of all, I think Common Core is a horrible idea. It is something, it is, it is something where it's exactly like Obamacare. You have a bunch of people sitting in a faraway place in Washington who think they are smarter than we are, who are going to dictate to every community in this country how they educate their child. That's not America. So Common Core should go. And the more important thing is we have to scale back the Department of Education dramatically. It is too big, like the rest of the government, too big, too powerful, and too intrusive. Education has always been a state controlled issue. I am a believer that the best government is the government closest to the people. So leave education to the local schools, the district schools, the states, and let the education department get information on best practices that they can distribute, but not try to tell our schools and our parents how our children are educated in America, period. Turn to the screens, another video question from Stephen. Gotta love those young Republicans. That is, uh, that's our grandson, Stephen, who lives outside Austin, Texas. Uh, his father is the one who was the Marine Lieutenant in Anbar. And to be honest, I don't think Stephen thought of that question by himself. <laughs> I think his parents kind of put him up to that. Uh, but we don't need Batman or Spider-Man to beat Hillary. All we have to do are two things. First of all, ask her what she's accomplished. You know, whether it's Benghazi, Libya, the reset with, uh, with Russia, or uh, pulling out of Iraq, her record of achievement is zero. Uh, uh, and you can understand why she destroyed all those emails. I'd be embarrassed, too, if anybody had a chance to see them. But more importantly, we have to have a positive agenda as to how we can grow America's economy, create more jobs, strengthen our defenses, take control of our borders so we know people come here legally and, to, and for the right reasons, and have 
an agenda that the American people can look at and say, yes, this will make this great country even better. She doesn't have a growth agenda. She doesn't have a positive agenda. She's going to try to frighten people, you know, that we're against the middle class, we're against women, we're against gays, we're against immigrants, we're against workers. They frighten people. Our job is quite simply to inspire people. That's what Republicans have always done. That's what we will continue to seek to do. And we will beat Hillary, and more importantly, win the future for America. In the time we have left, Governor, we have a video question from Reeve in Exeter. Hi, I'm Reeve, and I'm from Exeter, New Hampshire. Governor, do you think there's hope for the future? You know, it's sad that a young person is asking that question. This is America. You know, we may be horribly disappointed in Washington and our government, and I know I am, but we're still America. And I have to tell her, being born at this time, in this century, in this country, is something where you should look to the future with unlimited optimism. This is America, and we're Americans. And the best has always been ahead of us. If people doubt that today, and I've heard that question across New Hampshire, what are we going to do? Is the, tomorrow going to be OK? All we have to do is fix Washington. Our country isn't broken. Our people isn't bro aren't broken. Our states aren't broken. Washington is. Get it out of our lives. Reduce its size. Reduce the tax burden. Repeal things like Obamacare. Make the politicians understand they're not our masters. They're our servants. We shouldn't have to do what, what they tell us. They should have to do what we tell them. We get that back to where America is. We reclaim the Tenth Amendment. Powers not specifically granted to Washington are left to the states and the people. Empower the people. And the answer is we are going to see the 21st century as America's next century, the greatest century. And you just heard from my grandson, Stephen. Stephen, you're an American. Be proud. You are going to have a better life than you could have possibly dreamed of because of this great country. Thank you. God bless you. It's been terrific being with you this morning. I enjoyed it very much, and I hope to see you again and again. Thank you. Peter, thank you. That was terrific. Thank you. Sure.